Hey everybody, today I have the honor of introducing our speaker. He is the lead pastor at Community Church in Kingsburg. Please welcome to the stage, Ricky Chambers. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> So 6 p.m., it's a beautiful spring evening. It's my senior year of high school, and we're playing baseball, and we've been doing batting practice all evening, hitting ball after ball on the tee, and I'm with my buddy Taylor, and uh, after the hundredth wiffle ball I hit off the tee, I turned to him and I asked, man, what are we doing? <laughs> What are we doing here all day long? Like I, like I get, okay, you know, you got you to gotta practice to train your body, to do the right motions and, and have the right technique. I get all that. But, man, what's the point of this? Like literally, like this is a, we're, we're hitting a ball with a stick. You know, we're taking a backyard game and we're really taking it serious right now. And uh, we're adding all this significance and arbitrary meaning to it. And like, what, what are we doing? What's the point? And at that point, my baseball career was over. Because if you can't answer the why, why you're doing something, you don't have a sufficient reason to push through those hard times, to push through the times that are maybe trivial, maybe don't seem like they're important, to push through those maybe more difficult times. And to get you on into greatness, you can't do that unless you can answer the why. So this morning, I want us to consider the why What's the point? And to help us with this, we're going to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's wisdom literature uh, from the Old Testament. So there's three books of wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job from the Old Testament. And Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. And he was the wisest king over Israel and also the richest king and most prosperous king. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he's going to peel back the layers to reveal the vanity of life under the sun. And he's looking for true meaning. He's looking for true purpose. And he's searching for the answer of why. So it's a bit of a thought experiment with King Solomon this morning. And we're going to have to ask, what's your life all about? What are your goals? What are your motives? What's driving you? How do you know it's not all a waste? And realistically, what will you actually accomplish with your life, and, and we can live our whole lives without ever addressing these questions, and then some do later in life, and we call it a midlife crisis, because you followed everything the culture's told you to do. You've accomplished the American dream. You have enough money, you have success, you have a great job, and you're left empty still, asking the question, why? What is the purpose behind this? You're working for the weekend, and the Weekend no longer satisfies. You're working for the new toy, and that new toy no longer satisfies. Maybe you think marriage is going to satisfy you one day. You think they're going to solve all your problems. They're going to complete you. And you realize they're not capable of that because they're your problems. Your spouse can't fill that void. So you're putting your hope and your dreams in things that are not capable of satisfying because there's only one who is worthy of that. There's only one who's capable of that. So as we pursue truth and meaning, and, and as we pursue it in humility, you're going to ask better and better questions. So we don't simply question things to question things. We don't simply deconstruct things to deconstruct them. We deconstruct things. We question things to find answers. And that way we can reconstruct our lives and our motives and our hearts around the answers that we do find. So this morning, we're going to read uh, some of Ecclesiastes together, and it's going to leave no stone unturned in your hearts. It forces us to consider all of who we are, all that we think, all that we find our hope or despair in, and we'll draw this out so that we can make an accounting of each one of those things and be able to say, what's driving my life? And is it capable and moreover worthy of doing so? So we're going to open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and chapter 2 this morning. As the preacher laments over life under the sun. He says the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. NIV says meaningless. 
meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Meaninglessness, vanity. And the Hebrew word translated here is the word havel, and it literally means vapor or breath. It's there, and then it's gone. It, it dissipates. It's something that's fleeting, something that's elusive, like beauty is fleeting. Power is fleeting. Fame is fleeting. Our lives are fleeting, and it's all in vain. It's all vanity because nothing changes. There's nothing new. History repeats itself, and, and it's a paradox. It's meaninglessness, says the teacher. It is all meaningless if everything is fleeting and nothing ever truly changes. We live, we work, we eat, we sleep. Maybe we get married, maybe we have kids, and then we die. No one's going to remember us 100 years from now, just like we don't remember our great, great, great ancestors. You can't, you can even name any of your great, great, great ancestors. We never knew them. Don't feel bad about it. It's just like no one's going to remember us 100 years from now. No matter how many great things you've done or maybe how many terrible things you've done, nobody's going to remember that either. So stick with me. We're going to get to hope here. I promise it's not all sad. Continuing with chapter 1, Solomon says, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Why is life like this? Why does the world remain while we pass away, while we die? The place created for our enjoyment is now the place where we get buried in. What's wrong with this picture? Well, because the fall of humanity. We turn back to Genesis chapter 3. When sin entered the world, so did death. So did decay. We rebelled against God, and he brought judgment against Adam and Eve and the serpent who deceived, and it affected the whole earth. The world has fallen and bent by sin when it entered in. Because sin entered in, so did death and so did toil. Ecclesiastes goes on. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, around and around the wind goes, and on its circuit the wind returns. All streams run into the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already. In the ages before, so you're like, well, my iPhone's new, right? No, your iPhone is just an upgraded tool. It's a more sophisticated tool that helps us do very old things, communicate, read art, literature, listen to music. Supposedly it makes us more efficient, but I'm not so sure that's true anymore. Verse 11, Solomon goes on. He said, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. We're not going to remember I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. All is a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. There is something terribly wrong with the world, and it cannot be made straight. The things that are wrong cannot ever be counted. The state of the world is bleak, and the wise teacher despairs with the more knowledge he gains of what's happening around him. In chapter 2, he continues along this same thought. He says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart. How to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of men to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. 
I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the, the delight of the sons of man. Solomon had 700 wives. He had 300 concubines. Read that in 1 Kings 11. This guy was over the top pursuing this. It says in verse 9, So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. All my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. So he went over the top with everything. Anything he wanted, anything his eyes desired, he bought or he took or he had built for himself. It's incredible. Verse 11, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expanded in doing it. And behold... All was vanity. All was a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And now we get to the crux of the matter. We're going to skip ahead here in chapter 2. Solomon, he tried it all. He did it all. He achieved everything the world told us is going to make us happy. He had it all. And he found them all meaningless. All left him wanting. All were not an ends in themselves, but only a means. And he concludes this, verse 24 said, There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So the conclusion is, eat, drink, find enjoyment in your work. But you can't enjoy it without God. We're going to skip ahead here to the final conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, In chapter 12, verses 13 through 14, Solomon says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Okay, so the conclusion is essentially, without God, everything is meaningless. True and lasting joy is only found in God, and true meaning is only found in God. So there are two possibilities people are left with. One, everything truly is meaningless. There is no God, and as Hemingway said, life is a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. Or as Solomon says, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Pastor Tim Keller states of this, he says, people think Christians are naive, but if your origin is insignificant and your destiny is insignificant, then have the guts to admit that your life is insignificant. So this is option one. No meaning, insignificance, and vanity, futility. The problem with option one is a lot. There's a lot of problems with option one, but one big problem is that people even those who don't believe in God, I'm sure you know them, are convinced their lives have meaning, are convinced what they do has meaning, that there's some benefit to helping others, or some benefit to pursuing justice and human rights, and, and I in Scripture would agree with them, but it's only possible through the God of the Bible. Because option two is that there is a God, and he has a standard, and he has a will. And he has and will ultimately judge the whole earth according to this standard. His standard, not our standard. It's his standard. Hence the fall in Genesis 3. Hence the great flood in Genesis 6 through 9. Hence the final judgment at the end of the age in Revelation 20. He has a standard. But he also has a will. And that's seen in Genesis 3. Verse 21, right after he pronounces judgment on Adam and Eve because of their sin, he clothes them. Verse 21 says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. His will was to love them still. He gave them proper clothing. Amidst the curse, God's love comes through that he will provide. Amidst our suffering, He is there amidst our toil under the sun. He 
clothes us. His will was also to preserve the earth through Noah and his family. He cleansed the earth of injustice and violence, and he gave the earth a fresh start. And finally, his will was that none should perish. So he sent his only begotten son to bring salvation to the whole earth, all who would call upon his name. So if this is the case, quite contrary to everything being meaningless, every single action and thought that we take or have is packed with meaning and consequence. And we realize, if this is the case, that all those things we're pursuing outside of God is vanity. Because there's only life in God. Only true joy and true contentment is found in God. As Solomon says, apart from God, who can find enjoyment in life? God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Every breath we take is from him. So with our breath, we give him praise and worship. And this morning, your worship band killed it, man. The worship this morning was great. That's with our breath we give him praise. Because every breath we take is from him. He's given us eternal life. As Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, speaking of himself, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And he goes on and says, everyone who drinks of this water from the well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus, the word, who is God, who was with God in the beginning, is giving us and the woman at the well a lesson straight from Ecclesiastes. Whoever drinks physical water, water from this well, will be thirsty again and again and again and again until you die. But, and this is the good news of the gospel of Jesus, whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. See, we can chase the wind or we can drink from the rivers of living water. Chasing the wind means chasing meaning in the means. Chasing a meaning that's not present in pleasure. It's not present in comfort or competition or sports because meaning is not in the means. Meaning is in the end and the end is not death. The end is Christ because on the cross, Jesus cries out with his final breath, it is finished. That he has called us out of death and darkness and meaninglessness and vanity and into his marvelous light. That all of our hopelessness and all of our despair is turned to hope in Christ. That the things we do here and now, they aren't meaningless. In fact, the things that we do here and now in the name of Christ Jesus last for eternity and they count for eternity. The point now is that whatever you do, whatever your hands find to do, wherever you are, 7th through 12th grade, on into your career, whatever you find to do, do it as unto the Lord with hearts of gratitude to glorify him. Let that be your why. And watch how your interactions with your classmates and with your friends changes from competition, envy, or disgust. And watch how it changes to love because they too are made in the image of God. That's the bigger picture. And when you see the bigger picture, you see the bigger picture is that my friend Taylor, who's still one of my best friends, who I was, you know, lamenting over our baseball practice with, that we're still best friends to this day. And it will carry on into eternity. And it's not because of us that that's the case. It's not because of anything that we've done that it carries on into eternity, that life carries on into eternal life with God. It's not because of what we've done. It's because of what he's done. And you realize this life's not about you. I know what culture tells us. 
I know culture tells us it's about your identity. It's about, it's about you know, how you find yourself. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's all about him. All of scripture points to him, to the redemption of the world and what he's done. And if you're wise, anything less than Jesus, it is insufficient and it's vanity. Chasing the wind means chasing meaning in the means, chasing a meaning that's not present in the means. So we need to chase it in Christ. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 115, he says, what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. But on the cross, Jesus took what was crooked, and he made it straight. And he took what was lacking, and he paid the price in full. Because Jesus says, this is impossible with man, but all things are possible with God. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, the apostle John writes what he saw while he's being caught up in the spirit into the throne room of God. John writes, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. So this, by the way, is a scroll that's going to usher in the end of the age. It's going to usher in the final judgment uh, and and the new heaven and the new earth, the redemption of the world. Uh, Verse 2, John continues, he says, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll or to look into it? And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and the seven seals. See, the bad news of Ecclesiastes is swallowed up by the good news of revelation, the good news of Jesus. But we don't get to the good news. We don't fully comprehend the good news until we comprehend the despair and the hopelessness of the bad news. And Ecclesiastes takes us there. King Solomon has seen it all. He's done it all. And he's essentially saying, trust me, that stuff you think is going to satisfy you will not because it's not capable of satisfying you. So my advice for you all this morning is to live vicariously through Solomon. He did it all. Ten times over, anything that we're capable of. He was the richest and wisest man in the world. He could have anything he wanted. And he did. (laughs) He had everything he wanted. He says it's meaningless. It's vanity. Don't put your hope in that. Don't put your hope in that. He says only joy, only enjoyment can be found in God. Only meaning and purpose can be found in God, And at the end of it all, everything will, will be brought into judgment. And because of that, everything that we do here has consequence. It has meaning. So get off that merry-go-round of, man, you know, Jenny said that thing about my face and really hurt my feelings. And, you know, maybe if I just did this, I would be happy. Or, you know, Tyler's dating that other guy now. Or, and, you know, and, and I'm just, like, so upset about this. And, uh, you know, they're friends with somebody else. And... Um, I wish they invited me to that party. And, and it just goes on and on and on, and, and you're just trying to find meaning from what other people are saying about you. You're trying to find meaning in, in, in pursuing uh, greatness in these things outside of God. Only true meaning, only true joy is found in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you guys. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you uh, for your word that you've given us, that you've uh, revealed to us your son and you've brought to this world a savior, God. That while everything was in despair and everything was in suffering because of sin that entered in, you didn't give up on us. And you sent your son Christ so that relationship could be restored between you and us. And as in the garden before the fall, you walked with Adam and Eve. God, you're calling us to walk with you again. So God, I pray for all these students here. Um, may you give them the courage and the boldness to walk with you, to live for you, to glorify you in all that they do, Lord. Because it matters for eternity. So Lord, would you give them the wisdom to see that? Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey guys, let's play for Ricky.